welcome, whether you are here live with us in the building or when you are with us through digital means. Welcome. Good afternoon. We are voluntary prisoners gathered in a parking garage of all places. Normally, only cars meet here or criminals. We are in the building and the level is minus five. The temperature is plus 12. It's always plus 12. When you would re return here in 100 years, the temperature would still be plus 12. So the sanity of the organizers is doubtful, having the guts to invite us exactly here on a place like this. But in one respect, it may make sense that we are exactly here. It was also in a cave where the origins of architecture can be located, at least when we believe the big writers in architectural theory. Read Vitruvius, read Alberti, and you see the story and you see the story reconstructed that people assembled around a fire to get warm. Could be a good idea here as well. Um, around this fire, they learned the joy of meeting. They learned the joy of agreeing and disagreeing. They also learned to explore the benefits of crafts, the benefits of learning carpentry and masonry and all the other things that you um, have to know before you can start making architecture. Make, mastering the crafts. Mastering the crafts, it means controlling the crafts. But long after this scenes in the first caves, things ran out of hand. Essentially, architecture is about controlling the crafts. And of course, it still is. It is why we developed a discipline with an extensive range of competences. And we used this discipline to organize the people, to organize animals, to organize things in a maintainable order. But as I said, things ran out of hand. You will possibly remember the Chaplin movie, Modern Times. The eating scene, well, all the people coming from Eindhoven will know it because we use it each year in a theory course. What we see here is that the balance between control and being controlled is clearly disrupted. Disrupt disrupted heart. And after this scene, technology went on to spread its wings. Does it import the emancipation of us all? Was it for our benefits? Well, perhaps we can say that we are no longer in control anymore and that we are being controlled more than we would like. The material world, the, technolo the technological devices that were originally defined to be helpful, have started on their own. Our fate is perhaps to succumb. Our fate may be to defend. Our fate is perhaps also paranoia. And when I think of paranoia, the first man who comes to my mind is Husni Yunolu, uh, in Eindhoven, the inventor of the critical intermediate affairs. Um, and he will try to shed a light on what will happen this afternoon. Husni. OK, I thank you for this uh, introduction. I hope I am not too paranoid today. <clears throat> so uh, let's give a little uh, brief uh, information to you people what we like to do. So we, we started up in Eindhoven with a graduation studio called uh, Architecture in the Hyper-Liquid World to get access to this uh, um, hyper-modern times, which is a little bit further down uh, Charlie Chaplin. And we start up to have some kind of framework, and our framework to make it a little bit more concrete based on four, let's say, perspectives. 
The first perspective is uh, related to the uh, sociologist uh, Sigmund Baumann's approach, what he's saying about liquid modernity. He's saying that the permanence is only uh, the uh, change and uncertainty is the only certainty. The second perspective was of uh, sociologist Manuel Castells. He is combining uh, a new space, let's say the space of flows with the space of places, which is a reality in our times. The third one, the third uh, perspective is from the futurist uh, Ray Kurzweil. He wrote a very, really challenging book about the title is The Age of Spiritual Machines, in which, which he is actually saying that computers will exceed human intelligence uh, pretty soon. So the, finally, we put it together, let's say, these different perspectives in a certain hypothesis. The hypothesis is re uh, related to the philosopher Gilles Lipovsky, uh, he's coming up with this notion of hypermodernity. And he's saying hypermodernity is characterized by permanent movement, fluidity, and permanent flexibility. So, what does this mean actually for space, for architecture, for the culture of architecture, to think about art architecture and to make design about architecture? if the virtual world is becoming more and more dominant in relationship to the world as we now have here in this parking lot. So how can we deal with that as a designer related to our bodies, to our buildings, to our cities? Uh, what does it mean actually? Do we have any tools of architecture and urban design that could have any relevance in order to reflect on that, on this ongoing high-speed movement? and transformation. So in order to get access to that, we organize now a, a brief a debate. Uh, it's a huge field, what we are talking about, but we need to actually to bring it down to something that could be discussed in one and a half hour. We do have some uh, guests for that. Uh, Bernard Kohlenbrander, he will, uh, uh, let's say, will be the, it, you know, the person in charge to, to, to deal with the debate. We have one of our guests is Gordon Jack. So Gordon Jack is an architect from, uh, and working for Van Aken Architects, and, and he's very much involved in this development because Van Aken Architects is also one of the architecture offices working for Eindhoven for the uh, RSML for and creating actually a lot of new technological uh, spaces in which is needed to, to produce actually this uh, high-tech uh, uh, development. The other one is. Uh, Dirk van den Heuvel, he is an architect and chair of the Yabakama Study Center. And our third guest is Jack Timman, a policy researcher at TNO, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. So the last part is how are we organizing our uh, paranoid meeting today is based on three parts. Each part will start up with a pitch. Uh, the first pitch is, we call it, and each pitch will be actually will be started with a, with a student of five minutes, let's say. The, the copy of the first pitch is, we call it humanizing technology. This pitch is much more focusing on that, um, that technology is not only a tool, as we know, uh, for a long period, uh, technology be is becoming actually part of our body, you can say, if you think about the iPhone as an example. So we will discuss uh, on that and related to some buildings which might be also relevant to get the link with architecture, like Apple Store and Apple Park. The second pitch is related uh, to other topic, because this big data development has, on the one hand, created for us a huge opportunity to have access to knowledge, at least to information. Information is knowledge, we know that, but at least information. But on the other hand, this huge big data development, artificial intelligence and this kind of stuff is also the key element of a smooth way of surveillance and control. So what does this mean actually uh, in the uh, discipline of architecture? This is actually the second pitch. And the third pitch is related, we called it the rise of the man-machine landscapes. This is actually related to a development which is becoming more and more uh, relevant. There are more and more, let's say, uh, spaces where no human is involved at all. 
artificial landscapes like big data or data centers, but also uh, factories where products get produced with very little or no human um, intervention. So this will be the three pitches, and we will start up with the first pitch, and I hope uh, you will have an interesting debate. You will be a participant in this interesting debate. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Husni, but before you leave the table, um, let's come to a crucial question in the beginning, before we start with the presentations. Um, it is obvious, I think, that the, that the, that the digital revolution, revolution and that the um, dispersal of artificial intelligence, etc., first of all, creates a virtual world. Now, the happy thing is that architecture is exactly the opposite. It is the real material world par excellence. So one might easily assume, don't worry, dear architects, don't worry, go on. Realize your beautiful buildings, just like you did before. There's no reason to worry, is there? I mean, if you are paranoid, I would think in this way. Uh, ah. But if you are a little bit smart, and you will also take account and think about uh, the, let's say, the, the purpose of our discipline, which is always changing related to technological, social, political, etc., power-related relationships, it was always a part of our domain. So, I mean, if architecture, if you look as an architectural historian or theory, uh, architecture is always some kind of reflection on ongoing uh, uh, transformations, and yeah. technological transformations has been always a very important part of that. So if you would say now, Let's have a cappuccino and everything is fine. Nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing, no reason to have any, any uh, doubts about. Then I would say something is going really wrong. Okay, that's why we are today in this cave. Okay, uh, thank you very much about this. But and now we are almost starting with the first case study. But um, before we're going to do that, I want to um, inform the audience, both at home and here with us, that there's a possibility to intervene in the discussion if you like, using the papers on the chair when you are with us, or use the digital device on your computer, whatever that is. So um, now we turn to the first of the three case studies. Um, the first case study will be presented by Xu Willemsen, and the term, the basic term that applies to this first presentation is humanizing technology. The floor, the floor is for you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. So my name is Sue Mavison, and um, we, I will briefly talk about the topic of hypermodernity and the role in Apple's architecture within this. So first, let's start with a small introduction of hypermodernity. So Luciano Floridi approaches the topic of hypermodernity through increasing digitalization in a physical world. From this, societies are becoming more and more dependent on the digital in order to create and develop their social welfare. And for societies to become more dependent, the links between different digital devices is key. Thus, the more links and nodes there are within a digital network, the better a digital society can function. Hypermodernity thrives on data collection, on data analysis, and eventually it can be used to influence users' behavior. And in this sense, Apple as a brand is no different than any other electronics companies. But then how is it that Apple stands out, that Apple sets itself apart from these other companies? During our analysis, we refer to this as the Apple vacuum. So it's the image of Apple that lures users into the vacuum that is the digital world. How does this image, uh, or how does Apple communicate their strong image, the feeling of exclusivity, and the pleasing aesthetics that they offer the user? Well, they do this through physical anchors, tangible matters like product design and architecture, because these have the ability to create an immediate understanding of what Apple is about and what Apple stands for to the users. An example of this is Apple Park II, located in Cupertino, California. It's also referred to as the Infinite Loop Building, and it's claimed to be one of the most innovative buildings of this time. 
And in the renders that you can see here, Foster and Partners uh, present Apple Park II as a very transparent and accessible building. But in the physical reality, Apple Park II is non accessible for you and me. Only the most valuable employees of Apple can get into this park. There is no visual connection from surrounding roads, and the building is so gigantic that the sense of human scale and human connection is replaced by emptiness. This building is used by Apple as a physical anchor through which Apple can visualize what they stand for, what their image is, through architectural elements. And the building serves the purpose of representing and communicating the image of Apple to the users. Also in the Apple stores, uh, this architectural appearance comes back. So the strong image that Apple wants to pursue. So where these stores, they have uh, the same aesthetics. Um, and uh, when one is in these stores, they feel almost consumed by the Apple atmosphere. And they become a part of this Apple community. Thus, the image that Apple wants to pursue is one of their leading or main drivers in architectural design. This then makes us question, has technology affected, for example, classical architectural elements? And how has the notion of a theme like transparency changed because of the rising of the digital? Transparency used to stand for a medium to open up closed spaces, where a means of simultaneous perceptions of spatial locations is possible. But if we cannot reach Apple's buildings anymore in a physical world, then what's left of the notion of architectural elements like transparency? Has they the, do they then only become a tool to represent things of the digital world, like the Apple devices and the Apple image. Thus, the closing question can then be, has an architectural element like transparency gained an extra dimension because of the rising of the digital? Or is the digital actually limiting classical architectural elements and turning them in to means towards a digital end? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Xu. Will you join us on the table? Um, it gives me the opportunity to introduce the, the panel. On, on my right hand, I have Gordon Jack, who is an architect of, uh, of von Aachen Architects and very much involved in issues that are similar to uh, issues that, that are also playing a role in, uh, in Apple, I think. Then we have uh, Jack Thiemann, who is a po policy analyst at the TNO. Uh, very well welcome. And on my left hand, I have Dirk van den Heuvel, associate professor. In Delft, well, Xu, um, Apple, Jack, oh. do you would like to intervene in this, in, this, in this case study? Yeah, I think it's very interesting to talk about the, uh, the, the, the design and the image of Apple as, as this, uh, this front runner of, of the good and the sleek. Um, and when I think back at my own practices and uses and of these ICT tools that you see that actually what they do and what they have set the tone or the archetype for is obfuscation by design, right? So the, the, you see it in the physical shops and the experience, it should be friction free. And, and that is uh, something they don't do themselves alone, but they were one of the first to do that both in hardware and software to make sure that you're not bothered by technology. And what this actually does is for me, it, it moves us further away from what is behind. Uh, so this whole image of sleek and, and being um, accessible actually takes us further away from what it is. It's, um, uh, and the risk in that I see is that this image becomes more important than what is going behind. And this logic what are going behind is actually where, the, yeah, where all the stuff happens. And so uh, th this, I think, is interesting as a, as a kind of cultural image of what, what, what Apple is. On the other hand, if you're a bit critical, um, they lost the curve on being setting the tone and claiming the archetype. They claimed the archetype of the, of the smartphone. They claimed the archetype before of the computer. Every design and architect office had an Apple. They claimed the archetypes of, of, uh, of the type of offices. But you see that now it's, 
they've been repeating the same thing. So, so what is new? And what is new there is the, the game in the ICT world and also in Apple has moved from hardware to software. So the, the next battle is in AI and in backward systems that we as a consumer have no um, real insight into anymore. And I think that is interesting that that whole discussion of hardware and archetypes uh, that were very visual and also very haptic, uh, the, the Cupertino white and the sleek phones and the, the super nice uh, designed uh, object to the two have, also as a status symbol, is a bit gone and the digital doesn't replace the same thing. Of course, there's an Apple store and there's particular ways of interaction design, but they're not the front runner there anymore. So I'm very curious what is the next kind of winner in setting this sleek, uh, hyper-modern image and pushing us to what is the next frontier? So I think, I, for my feeling, we're a bit stalling. And, and in my personal experience, and then I'll stop, is that I think, the, um, for me, so, uh, the, the, the image of, a, of an Apple store, for instance, is, is uh, it's interesting in one way from a, from a very kind of American customer journey experience. But as a technologist and a designer and a developer, it's very frustrating because you, you, it's like being in a candy store, but you cannot touch anything. Or, and th th there is directly, there's no fiddling anymore. There's no Avalon type of let's play with stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, so this, this pushes you away as well from what made Apple so special. And that is that you could tinker and play and be part of that community of that image. And now you're pushed as a consumer of that image and not anymore a, a brand uh, de co-developer. And I think that is a bit the, the how I see Apple now, if I look at this uh, kind of representation. Yeah, yeah. You look at, at Apple as, uh, as a brand in the first place and how they, how they manifest themselves on a variety of, um, uh, of practices. But more specific, their um, responsibility in architectural terms. You must recognize something uh, in, their, in their approach to buildings issue and to, to design issues. Oh, of course, I mean, they, they, uh, they are trying to be the front runner in uh, uh, creating a sustainable image for themselves, uh, good quality materials, uh, uh, sustainable, and also in terms of the community. If you look, though, at the, um, first of all, the, the, the Apple stores themselves are quite context-less. As in terms of architectural branding, they are really uh, related to their own product. So they're very sleek design, very elegant, high-end, uh, very efficient. But what is interesting is that it is I mean, in terms of architecture, their architecture is kind of uh, very neutral. Eh? They're, they're, it's the same as the iPhone. The iPhone is kind of a, a device which you can access and yes. get information from. The, the architecture that they create, like the, the reference of Fifth Avenue, is very, I mean, it's, it's not that special, I would say. But it's very interesting that what, our, uh, what uh, our, uh, Apple do is the relationship or the positioning themselves within cities, the physical world. Mm -hmm. So it's their, their, their physical interface for their digital product is associated with very important uh, cultural uh, locations within major cities, for example, mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue, but also in, uh, in the Champs Elysees in Paris or in uh, Regent Square, uh, Regent uh, Street in, in, in London. They, they have this uh, uh, very uh, unique ability to position themselves in a physical world yeah. where you start to associate this elegance, this quality. Uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, one of the great examples is having a shop in Grand Central Station, which nobody else could do. But Apple, as soon as you come into Grand Central Station, you have this beautiful iPhone experience of uh, uh, like Apple uh, shop experience. They are associating themselves in a physical world uh, yeah, to, 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 to already uh, 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 a piece of architecture which is of uh, cultural importance that already then kind of like elevates their own, uh, let's say, their own architecture uh, to a higher level without really doing very much. With basically, they take their very simplistic, elegant architecture design, they associate it in a very important, predominant location within cities, and then with that uh, combination, create a very uh, a good, yeah, good strategy, a good uh, branding strategy for them. A good branding strategy, brilliant business. That's what we can say of it, yes. So when you investigated this for the, for the studio in Eindhoven, did you do it with, did you understand from the beginning, instantly, what the, what the relationship was with, between the Apple issue and architecture at large? Well, not from the beginning, but as soon as, because we had Apple Park 2 in Cupertino to uh, analyze, 
but we immediately felt with the group like there is somehow a mismatch. I don't know exactly where they are communicating everything that they implemented in the architecture of Apple Park 2, where it is for, because no one can see it from there. And then, of course, um, we kind of came to the realization that it's of the image of Apple and that they somehow transmit this image through the digital to kind of spread and connect to these users and then tell them like, hey, this is what we are about. And they show that via, um, via the architectural elements. So then we started to think like, oh, that's this, it's really interesting branding and it's very smartly put up in that way to, to uh, indeed connect people to the digital via these physical anchors and the things that people still understand. You think that, that even that, that the building, that, their main, that their, their main building that they created for themselves, that it supports the branding strategies as, as strategy as well? Yes, I think so, because they did, um, uh, for example, also the facades, they had to create completely new technologies for that to create the, the curved yeah. panorama panels. So, and it's also one of, I believe, one of the most expensive buildings ever built. But if you look from the surroundings, it's not visible. So I really think that uh, this is especially done to, to still show them and uh, tell people that this is like Apple that's there. Well, but I would say, but then I go to, to Derek also with this question, then I say there's nothing new with this. Um, this, what, what Apple does, use the, the, the brand as something that plays a role from the smallest detail to the biggest object. Well, it's, it's all about industry. When we, we can refer, Derek, and you probably also know the example of Peter Behrendt and AEG yeah. in Berlin. That was our, about design, but also about buildings. It was yeah. actually about yeah. everything. So what's new? There's nothing new here, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, there's not, yeah, that's a nice statement. There's nothing new, but it's always a new variation on things that we know from the past, maybe. That's what you can say this new. What I find interesting about this development and why you are looking at Apple and the different questions of where is architecture is that, that, we, that it's a new phase for Apple as well as a, as a multinational or as a company because Apple was never before involved in developing architecture and using architecture for branding or for building uh, its offices, etc. It was before very much anti-architecture, I would yeah, say. Yeah. So now the system of the digital and Silicon Valley calls in the system of architecture. I'm really curious what is happening there because they are different systems, of course, and you can use them for different purposes. So how does this assemblage of systems then is going to work and going to yeah, further push uh, us into the future, I mean, I find it quite interesting to, to watch. It's a bit scary, and uh, <laughs> the paranoia. Uh, I don't know yeah, if it's, it's sc scary, effort, you but, could, uh, but it's interesting that you remark <laughs> that, that the, the building is actually the, the pinnacle of, of a development that started with the, with the earliest uh, yeah. uh, uh, developments that they did, inven in inventions that they made, that needed no architecture at, far at first. Yeah. They simply needed a production facility, but now at the end, the story is finished. Now they also have a building which actually supports the brand just as the telephone does. Yes. Do, you, do you recognize that, that the, the, the necessity to have, to, to have all the components of the brand? Yes, of course. I mean, like uh, we, we haven't even talked about the back of house, which is like the facilities that actually build these the iPhones. They're they are not a part of the branding exercise at all at this moment in time. Perhaps in time they will become more in the forefront of it. But it is, you have, you have multiple different things. You have the, 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 um, the f facilities that make the product themselves, you have the people who engineer it, and then you have the people who sell it, or they, they kind of like those kind of components. Each of them play an integral role in the overall branding of the, uh, of, of the, the business itself. At the moment, or what, what is very interesting to see is like now the Apple Park 2 is becoming also like, what you said before, it was a standard office that the Apple had before, as well as all these high-tech companies. Now the office is becoming part of the branding, the lifestyle, how you're kind of creating a community, how you're engaging with the local surroundings, how you're helping uh, society, bringing, creating jobs, etc. That's all a part of branding, branding, branding. Whether or not it is um, a good building or not, that's another discussion. But it's, it's, it's all a part of that, the end goal of, of essentially what it is, is to sell a product in the end. 
And if the uh, what we are seeing also, like the, the back of house, where the facilities are now making these productions, are coming a little bit more into the forefront, where they want to showcase. You see also with the Amazon companies, want to kind of like advertise and yeah. promote how efficient they are, how they, how well they uh, can basically produce uh, uh, of, of the automated uh, systems. That will become also one other, yeah, another important uh, factor in the yeah. kind of the overall branding. Uh, yeah. Eventually, Jack, I want to to add something to the discussion that we did not yet discuss yet. But it starts with Apple with a brand and the, and, the, and the variety of manifestations of the brand. But this topic is presented under the label of humanizing technology, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the the building that they just produced for as, as a main office is is maybe the pinnacle. But I think that humanizing technology has also kind of um, a prophecy or, or, um, or uh, a promise. And this, that promise is that, that the end is not the building, but the end is to control behavior. I simply want to refer to the famous book of which I, of course, forgot the title, title of Dave Eggers. Ah, who, yeah, the uh, circle. The circle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The circle, which indeed shows that, that it does not stop with the building. Mm -hmm. oh, There's no. more to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the circle is, of course, well chosen because it was not for nothing yeah. uh, a relation to this yeah. uh, infinity building, uh, although it says more about the, the other uh, search engine slash advertising company than it says of, about Apple, but it's a bit the same. Um, the point is that, I don't know, there's a couple of things to say about that. The, the, the first is, I think, that the... the um, if you look at the building like that, it's, it's, a, it's a particular uh, statement. Huh? Uh, and and, and that statement is, is now, in, in hindsight of a year of COVID and working back from home, it's a bit of a strange thing to do, to, to build a very pompous building where you'd want people to go to, uh, where actually, um, uh, and here I agree with, with, uh, uh, with my speaker on the, on the left, that the, these buildings are not anymore about the place where you work, but it's more about showing what you uh, what you stand for in terms of human human technologies and in that sense for me the building was not so much in the news in terms of architecture and apple in the last couple of years but but more the the kind of advertising they did about privacy and about taking a political stance yeah. against us uh, so you see that these companies they they have this kind of need to uh, and, and very pragmatically also for apple it's a way to get rid of some surplus money and at some point you need to put it into something so let's make this huge big building to 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 as a crown to to that 10 20 nice, years uh, five uh, five billion uh, yeah. dollar investment in the, in the park yeah. yeah and 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 that is that is one way but i think the other way that that they they want to address this human technology part and which is kind of interesting is that you see now that these statements that used to be very far away from the corporate world about uh, quality of life, about taking care of your workers, but also about uh, responsibility, sustainability, and also privacy, these kind of values, now start to become kind of core of the, of the next message of, yeah, if we want to do this well, uh, uh, we need to make it human-centered and look at us, we are already leading the way. So we, we do take care of your privacy and we do that, and they actually do that very well. Um, so we saw, and as a privacy and, and surveillance scholar back in the days, I found it very interesting that that move was, uh, uh, first they didn't want to talk about these things, and now the, and the, the human was more a consumer, and now you see that the human element is, is, it's more than only a branding. There's also a really idea that if we want to <coughs> do this on the long run, uh, and, um, it's, it's, uh, these kind of values become not only key uh, selling points or key, key kind of uh, messages, but there's something underlying as well about they have a major influence in on where this technology is going. And they show that also in these type of buildings uh, to push that, but also in um, uh, making the statement, uh, being politically almost active uh, with this kind yeah. of billboard. So they also physically show themselves a need in the space to make these kind of statements where 10, 20 years ago, they would not uh, bother with that. Right? They would say, we're, we're, that's not politics, it's not what we uh, want to uh, dabble in so overtly. So I thought that was interesting that, of course, this building was in the news, but for me, the, the billboards on their privacy statements against the, the Googles and the Facebooks were, for me, the interesting thing to see as a manifestation in public space on their values and how they put the human-centered, actually, as a kind of next step to uh, if we, uh, all this AI and big data in the back end. That's one thing, but we need to make sure that we keep it uh, to the front and we keep it human. And that, I think, is an interesting kind of political, but also social uh, statement, in a way. 
I don't know if you, you wanted to go there, but that's kind of my reflection on that. <laughs> Finally, before we get to the, to the next case study, thank you, Jack. Um, this doing this project, Sue, what did it do? do you, what, what has it done for your definition of, of what architecture really is? Well, it did make me uh, think of how it would slowly start yeah, to evolve, because then I kind of saw when we analyzed Apple Park that already how they use transparency and uh, connectivity and accessibility, um, that it is in the building there, like the ingredients are there, but the people that should make use of it are not there anymore because it has become this physical anchor and um, this means to a digital world. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where it's going to take us, but it's definitely interesting to, to see um, these architectural elements start to change much more and become also a way of representing transparency uh, instead of like really interacting or creating transparency in a physical world. So I think, yeah, it's interesting, but it could also be like a limit, yeah, for architectural elements. Thank you for being with us. We move to the next case study. And now the, the things become more serious. Now we, 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 it's, it's not anymore on humanizing technology, but the next step is surveillance and control. So there we are. Narindat Maria will present part of the graduation project. The floor is yours. Thank you. Surveillance has always been a broad topic that held specific narratives that resulted in ideas of unleashed power, fear, and control. But the aspect of surveillance being instinctual to people and the systems that people made seems to be besides the point. In the hypermodern, surveillance follows three self-evident components, the economic market, technocratic efficiency, and the individual. The position today considers surveillance as a machine that has transposed the culture of suspicious behavior and self-correction to a more continuous operation of modernizing. Through spatial design, surveillance can be read in the city. The animated city considers surveillance through the human gaze, which gives an a law of community. The panoptic city regards surveillance through cameras that gives a presence of safety and control. And the entrepreneur city engages surveillance through technology to give an impression of efficiency. All in all, surveillance is merging all spaces with multiple narratives, devastating the boundaries of the, the physical space and the issue of privacy is gone to the wind. In the physical space, technical artifacts all work together to expand the flow of data. Equally, technical softwares work symbiotically to organize mass data in a post-structural surveillance scope by linking information to data doubles. The virtual space is an economic space that is seeping into all life spheres, and the surveillance principle, mechanism, and authority are at the heart of gathering, collecting, and influencing. No longer the notion of life away from the virtual surveillance space. The infrastructures are in place, individuals are connected, and the virtual is the land infinite. Rooted in the physical, surveillance has leaped into the virtual. The registry of the self is seamless in the surveillance machine, and the accumulation of knowledge is boundless. And with the abundance of data leads to a strong potential for knowledge. With the vast amounts of information circulating the globe, it is no surprise that humans have left the field of trying to understand this, but instead adapted machine systems to render valuable information at a moment's need. The meaning applied to information is now beyond the scope of the human, and the mediation of machine intelligence is needed. Therefore, is it accurate to suggest that meaning is only provided through technical mediation? In my thesis, it became curious to wonder, is surveillance so seamless in the context of the real and the virtual that the only way to become aware of this is to go through some form of architectural experience, like an initiation that will leave the individual provoked to the ongoing things, to the hidden layer of the virtual and the all-encompassing aspect of surveillance? In my thesis, I focused on the virtual panopticon as an architectural space, depicting the contemporary form of collecting individuals' information and then recycling this information back to people as prediction. This curiosity was the driving force behind these illustrations. Is it then a potential for architecture to produce experience to put forth the pervasive systems of surveillance, 
and what tool does architecture have to gain a form to the virtual aspect of surveillance? Thank you for your attention. I invite you to join us on the table, at the table, Narindat. This horrible table. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, one of the, of the side effects of being in a cave is that um, acoustics are terrible. <laughs> uh, so you need to help us out. Yes. And, and, and I did not really grasp the core of your graduation project, which went, came under the flag of surveillance and control. Yes. I I began to saw in my uh, architectural thesis that uh, surveillance was becoming all pervasive. And I was starting to wonder what form could architecture give this? And because of the inheritance of the Panopticon and architecture and its inheritance, I started to view the idea of the Panopticon being a virtual theater. Mm -hmm. So I designed a space that would be representative of a virtual theater. Although my architectural project... You designed a th theater, that was the, the topic? The, th the, the thesis was based on surveillance, and it uh -huh. was a building that was constructed as a system. So it, it illustrated both the, the system of gathering data, processing data, and then recycling data. Okay, um, but I, st I still don't have it completely sharp. Okay. What I tried to find is that how could I represent surveillance physically, yeah. um, but with its virtual behaviors. And it was basically connected to the surveillance capitalism idea from Susanna Shuboff with her ideas that data is being collected and recycled, not just for the interface, but for people. Okay. 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 Now we're getting into a, in, the, in the foggy world, foggy world of, of, of how privacy is controlled by surveillance. Yes. Is that playing a role to an arc and daily practice? These kind of issues? Uh, no, but maybe I can uh, add something extra because actually, listening to your presentation for five minutes there, we've actually done a, we, we, a theoretical project similar to this. It was based on the Panopticon's uh, buildings, the cupoles, the, uh -huh. the prisons uh, yeah, the prisons. built here in uh, Harlem, uh, Arnhem, and Arnhem. Uh, in one other Breda. Place, Breda. Breda also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and because they came up uh, um, on the market for sale to be renovated. And of yeah. course, they were based on the theory from Jeremy Bentham of this kind of like um, reformation from not knowing of uh, if you're being surveilled uh, at what time. So the prisoners are all in uh, a physical building and they do not know if they're being watched. So uh, the idea is that you reform yourself without that interact uh, um, intervention of being surveilled. And what we had as a, as a project was, uh, and I think it's maybe similar to what your project is about, is, is to kind of like to bring as a, um, to, to try to show to the people, uh, to, the, to, to us as, as, a, as a community now, what is actually online is not a visible. Yeah. So what we had as a theory was that we, instead of having a couple where one person looks out and the people are in the cells, you could invert it so that you, when you're in the, the building itself, you're literally projected with all your digital life. You're literally taking your, your digital uh, world and putting it on a display so that you can actually physically see it. And it's quite confrontational because then you realize just how yeah. significant the data is being mined on you uh, at any given point in time. I'm sitting here right now. I have my 4G on. Google knows where I'm, I'm sitting. They know who I'm interacting with because we are all in the same situation, uh, uh, same, same hall here. And, so, uh, and it's also like the interactivity of who's going online. If I look you up later on on LinkedIn, for example, everything is, is being collected on you. And that kind of like interface is very exciting as a, as a kind of like a, a very confrontational if you have a certain, I, I guess that's what your image is about yes. uh, and, some, and somewhat like that, where you're, you're almost uh, uh, awkwardly uh, pre presented this, this amount of data and information towards you. And whether it's a good or bad thing, I, I don't know. It depends on who, who you, what you do, I guess. Mm -hmm. If you if you feel like it's, a, it's an issue or not. Uh, but let, let's let's bring it back to a basic issue. But it's kind of, I can also ask you that that uh, not in that the, when you refer to to, to, the, to the, these prisons to the panopticon, then then it's then it's easy to um, uh, to represent it as a type. Yes. Um, but now, when we look at the new definitions of surveillance and control, can we bring it to to, to the general? representation of a type or is that 
Yes, actually. that was indeed something that I uh, struggled with with my thesis because with the type aspect, you, you, you're basically confronted with also the inheritance of what that type represents. So for instance, surveillance with Bentham represented a type of self-correction and a self-regulation. But we see now that surveillance as a principle has evolved. So how to then show this evolution in a type? But is a type enough to even show that? Because now we're dealing with something that is very instantaneous, where data and, and influence from data is happening in the moment without, and what I suggested, seamlessly. All right. Is this, uh, this issue playing a role at TNO's uh, research desk? Well, <laughs> de de depends. I, I, um, uh, if I speak from my personal um, account, I, I, before I worked at TNO, I was a, an academic researcher. Yeah. I, um, my PhD was in surveillance studies, so I, I, I have dabbled in this for a while. And TNO is really an, an applied research institute, so what we actually do is we try to understand these themes of, uh, of surveillance and data and digitization and see what actually you can do about that. So there's a big field that's called privacy by design, of course, that looks at solutions of data privacy from a technological yeah. point of view. So how can you protect data, uh, data security? Uh, but wider than that, and of course now in the, in the world that we move to AI and predictions, it's not even real time, it's in the future. Right? So the real time is already past us. So that becomes interesting because then the the ideas and the, the tools we have both methodologically in the design phase as well as in the kind of institutional and democratic after um, uh, protections, they don't hold anymore. So for instance, a, a, a GDPR, a general data protection regulation in Europe that, that's supposed to protect citizens against massive data grabbers, it works to a certain extent, but if you think about these new types of systems that, um, uh, that are made based on predictions and profiling, the problem is the, the harm is and not, not individual. So it's not about me. The, the, it's not, I am not interesting as a an unit in the statistics. It's about a particular profile that I represent and, and in a particular demographic. Uh, and Deleuze already wrote about this in 1980, yeah. uh, uh, way before Suboff was even thinking about this topic. Uh, he already coined the individual to say it's about the divided individual and this individual is represented in particular databases. And what changes in surveillance is that the goal of surveillance in Bentham was to, uh, Bentham made the panopticon because he was against physical punishment. He thought it was barbaric. So he thought we need to re-educate citizens to the, yeah. the good life. In commercial surveillance and his, his individualism, it's the market, it's companies that are not interested in a higher goal of re-educating you. They're, they're, so the, the goal of surveillance had a purpose of a particular good political behavior in a particular time. But now that we lose that, the, the idea of surveillance is not a political project anymore, it's a market project. And that changes, that's one thing, so that really changes where this takes place. It's not the state versus a citizen, but it's way more companies versus consumers, and that's a really different arena. And what you see in this kind of, um, we had the last 10 years, this whole privacy by design and engineering field that we at and work a lot in, so how can you actually make sure that you can share data in a secure way. Um, that's a new topic as well, multi-party computation, where you can actually, untrusted parties can share data without ever knowing from each other that they do so. So there's a lot of technological advancements in data sharing, but that doesn't fix the problem of the, the intention of surveillance. So who is doing this and why? And, and the interesting thing is that the, the big tech companies of these days, they're not even interested anymore so much in, in um, your consumer behavior, because that's all predicted, that we're no, that, that's done. <laughs> it's now about workplace optimization, the Google, where, the Amazon warehouses and these kind of things. And there it's, but also the Uber drivers that are controlled by an algorithm and these kind of stuff. And that is hyper surveillance on the task, but they're not so interested in surveying this person. They're surveilling a particular work process that needs optimization, right? So this surveillance and optimization, that is really the, the new topic. And in that sense, I find it interesting that this kind of spaces are, uh, what does that mean in a physical mm. world again? Um, uh, that is very difficult because our interface um, to that world, to the, the it, maybe we have smart CCTV cameras still, but uh, th that we could physically interact with or we could hide our faces or, but now because we have that phone in our pocket and yeah. uh, we have the smart sensors in smart cities, um, 
all the, the, the surveilling takes place in algorithms way hidden, so we cannot push back or, or hide or find alternative routes or uh, divert this type of surveillance. And that makes it really new because it's something we don't really understand why is this happening and, ah. and who is doing this and for what purpose. Because the purpose of Bentham and, and uh, back in the day was to make us all good citizens, but that's no longer the purpose. So where is this going? And that I think is right. interesting and how you can reflect that in architecture would be very interesting to understand what these data flows actually do to us feeling also surveilled and feeling controlled. Because sometimes we do it voluntarily and we don't mind. Uh, we, we, we also live in a time of exposure culture. And the Hille Koskala wrote a brilliant paper already 10 years ago about how we are willingly participate. And, and this exposure culture is sometimes also empowering that we can have this way to express ourselves and to show ourselves and to share data. But there's so, that, so there's always a power balance between who, who claims that space and what can I do with that? And yeah. Is that data mine to curate or is it none? And what does that do? And I think projects like this can really help in, in we need to have better images or mirrors to reflect what that data says about us. And then the next step is to see what you can do about that. Uh, but to come back to your question, I tell you, no, we do a lot on this privacy by design and, and data protection uh, in an engineering point of view. And we also connect that to legislation and regulation and we advise governments on what is coming. But in this whole datafication and AI world, this is not so clear yet what is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dirk, finally, I want to turn to you because I, 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 I can imagine that these topics of uh, digital surveillance are not a surprise to you, but much of our research has, has been focused on the, on the 70s. Van Bakema, yeah, Van Eyck, yeah. in a period when these kind of topics were actually under the carpet, not playing a role at all. Yeah. Um, it was just... Yeah, yes and no. If, if you, so at the new institute uh, with the Bakema Study Center, we've been already looking into the archives to the prehistory of the digital, so uh -huh. to speak because the whole internet that we have today, uh, the data centers, etc., they didn't come just out of the blue. Uh, that, that's a, a prehistory. Pre so data centers or rekencentra, they have been built and designed before. Yeah. Uh, they, as buildings, they immediately come with surveillance technologies. So each of those buildings you see on the photos, for instance, that's also interesting that are immediately considered high-risk uh, locations. They immediately come with their own uh, gated sort of uh, technologies, uh, guards and cameras and all okay. that. Mm -hmm. It's all first about the, the computer room, which has to be completely secure, clean and hygienic, which is almost like a mm. religious space of that new machine where data and information is being processed and produced. Uh, so, what is interesting about that moment is that actually, uh, when you have, so it, 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 it overlaps with structuralism uh, in uh, Dutch uh, architecture. Uh, it uh, has relations with systems theory, yeah. uh, with Noam Chomsky, for instance, who yeah. was playing with the notion of deep structure, which was later considered a fallacy uh, and language theory. Uh, and What's interesting is that the architects try to develop a language that ties in with this same systems theory. And structuralism is really, as a formalist uh, language of architecture, uh, super well uh, uh, tuned to do this. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And there's a b there are beautiful data centers done. Uh, Rudy Blaker did one. Uh, okay. Also in the campus uh, in uh, Enschede, there's a beautiful uh, uh, data center or Reken centrum. Interestingly, it's not only universities, it's also banks. The first uh, data centers are for banks immediately. And the ABN AMRO data center of the early 70s mm -hmm. was by Van der Broek en Bakema for uh, Amstelveen with a cable directly to skip hole already, not, not as an as a internet hub, but immediately yeah, connected to the big infrastructures of communication technology. So, so there is a kind of way how the, yeah, we're in this parking garage, but that's, I don't think it's a coincidence <laughs> to be honest. I think the geological and the planetary system 
of how the infrastructure network is being built, or what Benjamin Bretton called the accidental megastructure. Mm. This is something that's being developed in various waves. And these data centers of the 70s, they were very much part of it. Uh, and the architecture had already then some sort of idea about it, how to develop it mixed with, that's interesting, brutalist sort of style of architecture. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this super interest in material associations, connotations, meanings, which we might now today think of as affordance theories or effect theory, mm -hmm. uh, bypassing the more uh, old school functionalist models, but, but indeed connecting the material immediately to the electronic eh? <laughs> and the digital. It's always, we're always talking about electronic things here. Yeah, yeah. It's very important to realize this. But that's interesting that this, this, yeah. this, this electronic world was, 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 was disguised, as it were, in a brutalist uh, camouflage. I think it's not disguised. Ah, it's not I think disguised. it really goes together. The one goes, uh -huh. I, I think it's also what you see with uh, the current blockchain technology, how it's developed. It needs high energy, it needs stable environments. I mean, in terms of geology, in terms of climate stable, those environments are spaces like we are in now. So the flexibility and the hyper liquidity that we talk with, they necessarily come with geologically stable constructs or environments. Okay, that's interesting to know, but that brings me also to some, the question that I want to ask to, to you, um, working at Van Aken, of which we all know that they are very much involved in ASML. Yes. Uh, so in ASML, you will have circumstances that, that may be similar to the data center to which Dirk refers of the 1970s. Um, but I don't have this, this, the idea that, that you have the inclination to, um, to dress it in brutalist architecture or something. Uh, no, but, uh, but <laughs> I, now, nowadays, like the, for, the, for the clean room environment, I was saying earlier in the, the previous speaker, it's now becoming some sort of a, a branding marketing exercise where it's no longer just a box that is a, is a, is a function, that, uh, the, the form follows the function. Now it's this nice blend. It's actually becoming an mm. integral part of not as, yeah, you have uh, data centers and clean room high technology buildings that are isolated away from the human view, but they're also now in really uh, the heart of communities and are becoming a very important uh, impact uh, to have high quality architecture, something that's integrated with the landscape, something that's integrated with the surrounding uh, uh, buildings. And I think that um, the, yeah, we're not, Brutal, if you're going to design a brutalist uh, building for, I think it could be very interesting, very beautiful to do. We have, it is, wh why not? It is almost like you're creating the, what you have here, something so robust and something so monolithic that what happens inside uh, almost doesn't matter. It's like the, the beauty, the, 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 kind of like the strength and ca encasing yeah. uh, of the outside. What is an influence of architecture for these types of high-tech buildings is that you almost want to create a building that, that represents strength, uh, robustness, uh, and efficiency, but also security, uh, and also uh, reliability. Something that's what architecture has to do. That's what architecture mm -hmm. has to do, so mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. uh, when, when you start to look at these uh, high-tech facilities, you, you see like, okay, this is, this, is, uh, uh, th th this is a building where I can put my, my data, my information, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm certain that that happens. But that's not how it is in the, in the, in the real world at this, at this moment, because they are hidden away. And that's <laughs> from yeah. the can, can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Yes, you. <laughs> because I was watching your project, and, and, and to me it had connotations of a disco club. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> but you were talking about a theater, for instance. Yes. So, I was wondering whether there is, because we talk about surveillance and control, etc. But this, there's also other ways of how the technology is being used for emancipation and liberation, and 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 so there's a whole layered yes. sort of reality there. Yeah. Where also groups and communities, well, they control themselves, but they can also control their new. Identity. Yes. So I was wondering if your project was also involved 
in those yes. new I think, yeah, things. I think, I think what you describe is like the spectrum of, of surveillance and, and that is not so much based on like the fear and control but it's, it's also about liberation and, and enlightenment at sometimes also. I think one of the main aspects of my project was to be provocative. So I wanted to very much confront um, the public with this idea of surveillance. And one of the main aspects that I thought was that it was seamless because we weren't so aware of what our, was happening to our data and what was, it was influencing us also. Mm -hmm. So a main part of my project and, and also the drawings was to be very provocative and to bring about also a space that seemed very uh, machine-like uh, and, and foreign. Yeah. May I ask her one question? Yes, sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe Go ahead. also you know that there, is, there a, is there a platform at the moment where you can physically access all the information that is being gathered upon you online right now? Do you know from your research if that is the case? Uh, or, or, uh, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> because it's ba based on uh, the, the, your, your project, your, the yes. idea was you wanted to project this, but yes. I wondered if there was a, uh, at this moment in time, uh, all data is, is a bit impossible, but there are there are quite some tools out there that um, it's called ghostery. So it's uh, it's systems or interfaces that that allow you at least to to see who else is watching when you're, for instance, browsing on a website. And there's lots of research done um, by, by by media studies scholars and others to kind of and the digital humanities to really trace back who is actually watching, uh, w w how these networks uh, uh, unfold and they become kind of universes, constellations of, of, uh, of nodes and, and edges it's, uh, it, it, with obscure companies that we've never heard of. Uh, so this is a very deep dive into a, a, a hidden world behind these flashy interfaces where often it's about data trading in, in real time, which comes back to the building and, the, and the, you know, it's on those centers where that trading actually happens in the bits and bytes that are hidden on the concrete structures somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and that real-time bidding is, I think, they, they yearly there's um, NGOs that publish reports on, on what your data is worth and how it's traded and et cetera. And it's, it's, it's kind of disappointing. It won't make you rich, all your data, but it's, uh, uh, there are ways to find this out, but, but uh, only to a certain extent. So. Uh, we only have one infrastructure that actually archives the web, and, the, and, and that's, a, that's a voluntary institution, right? That's uh, the Internet Archive. And for the rest, um, uh, it's often be behind closed proprietary silos or it's just lost. So the, the, the problem of data is, is also, and that I think is a nice contrast with the brutalist kind of buildings that need to be there forever, that the, the, the data and the infrastructure and, the, and the, the software in which all this data is being processed changes almost every year. So if you try to open a website from 1998, forget about it, right? So we think that our data is there forever, but actually it's the opposite. <laughs> we, we become kind of, um, uh, we forget even quicker about our own past. A, and, and that is interesting about this whole this data trails. Uh, and the, the, there's the this dystopia that, that our data lives there forever, but in practice, actually, it's very hard to find data of something forever because uh, there's no value in it, it's being thrown out, it's unfindable, the format has changed, uh, yeah. Flash doesn't exist anymore, uh, other formats will... So you see actually that in this whole archiving which would fit in this kind of monolithic somewhere in the countryside forever uh, base has a, has a very different use and reality to that. So yes, there are tools where you can find out who is checking you, um, but the downside of that kind of transparency is also that it makes you even more frustrated because then uh, there's a difference between knowing and acting upon that, right? So th does it help you to know who is tracking you or does it actually not? And, and what I find interesting is that now also in the, compared to the Apple story, there's new types of internet browser that actually use the, your privacy argument and to show you who is tracking and this choice. Um, and that are really becoming big, like Brave, for instance, that, that, that has started. Because uh, they don't only use the argument of privacy to say we, we stop you from, from trackers from tracking you. They also show the sustainability argument. So they show how, how less energy your search has cost because you're not tracked. Because all these trackers cost a huge amount of data and a huge amount of uh, that are absolutely not necessary. Right? Your first browser back in the day was uh, 70 KBs and it did the same as now and it's the size of a movie. And 
everything that's in between is only commercial trackers. And, and that is a, a kind of a world that we are now coming back to. And that's also why we need all these big buildings and data centers. The most of it is from an intrinsic point of view, useless data, because it's about buying behavior and tracking. And, and then this begs the question, do we really want to save that for eternity in beautiful monolithic buildings? Or is there actually something we need to be way more sparse about on what we want to save uh, and what those data centers should hold for future generations instead of just uh, um, <laughs> another, uh, this person wants a blue or gray sweater, right? And that is maybe the information that is not so interesting. So um, this tracking is also, if you find that out, who is tracking you, then often the reasons for doing so and the type of data will be vast, but not so surprising or not so revealing as um, we are quite predictable. <laughs> so, there's a, th th so there's a double side to that. So it's a, a good moment to get to the next case study. And we move from the hidden world to the world without humans, to the machine landscape. Narin Dat, thank you for being with us. Yeah, yeah. We're going to the last, to the final case study. It's presented by Karolina Kowalczyk. Yes, Bernard, for, thank you for the introduction. Um, now I see that the discussion at the table overlaps with, with what I'm going to show you, <laughs> but I hope uh, I can still surprise you or something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Machine landscapes. Spaces designed for hosting machines. Spaces in which machines are more important than humans. Tesla factory, where production is driven by AI, or ASML clean rooms where technologically advanced devices are manufactured can stand for examples of such environments. And so do data centers. Imagine the atmosphere inside AM4 data center in Amsterdam. Imagine yourself standing there in a big room. You can hear the humming of the thousands of servers and the loud ventilation system. It's cold inside, well, a bit like here, <laughs> because, um, yeah, the ventilation system needs to make sure that the devices don't get overheated. There are no windows in the room, um, so it's very difficult to tell the time. Well, the only light that is coming in is the blue light, LED, um, that is the one that emits least heat. The environment, as mentioned, is sterile. So the dust cannot disrupt the machines. The data needs to be safe, so you just cannot walk in. The, the access is restricted. So taking everything into consideration, the, um, everything around you tells you you're not welcome here. Data center is a physical artifact of virtual uh, activity. So one may ask, what is the role of architecture in data centers? In order to answer that question, um, I will use the diagrams. So starting from the left, you can see the city layout and the services spread around. So you actually need to go to places. In the second one, uh, the second one represents the idea of a building as a machine or the cross-functioning design approach explored by, by Rem Kolhas. In the data center, we have access to many services placed in a cloud. So it stores information, but people are physically taken out of this picture. They became users now, beyond the space and time boundaries. So can data center be the next step in this evolution? Let's take a closer look at the idea of a cloud. Webster Dictionary defines cloud computing as the practice of storing regularly used computer data on multiple servers that can be accessed through the internet. So yeah, correct. That's what the, the data centers allow us to do. So intuitively, the, uh, the cloud feels very ephemeral, and it feels infinite. But if we take a closer look at it, the building um, it's a resource-consuming piece of infrastructure. During the course, we made this model that shows the facade of AIM4 data center. But what happens inside um, is a metaphor, and it's a transition. So 
the mountain that is down there, it's a sand mountain, it represents the resources from which the structure emerges. Next, you have the platforms on which the servers are located, and everything is connected with cables that ultimately spread uh, and cross the, the borders of the building. So once again, <laughs> as in, uh, discussed in the introduction, does that mean that architecture has become instrumentalized? Or does it need new forms of expression in order to find its role in hypermodernity? I will leave that question to your reflection now. Thank you. OK, thank you, Carol. Do you join us here? Yeah. Carolina, why didn't you answer the, the last question? Did you post yourself? Yes, so yeah. I thought it's a nice uh, question for opening the discussion. <laughs> yes, but you can, you, can, you, you can give it an interpretation of yourself. Um, yes, so I think by analyzing the AM4 data center, it became interesting that the facade actually is meaningful and is the only piece that is on the boundary between the urban landscape and what's inside, because people are not allowed inside, but they still use the city and they still see it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's telling them you cannot cross because the moat is in there, so um, it's a boundary. Well, yes, but it's a boundary, but um, I think that there's also something to say that, that whatever they look like, beautiful or not, there's nothing new, and I think that Dirk, you had an association, right? Not a, nothing new. <laughs> um, the back, with the back of yeah, Yes, I, with, with the, the diagrams, it's fantastic to see this, those, uh, the, the building as a city and the computer as a city or a building and the cloud even. Uh, yes, I immediately said to Bert, oh, but it's completely like Bakema. Well, what's happening here? Because he also has these same models, and I think also even thinking in those, uh, what is it, metaphorical terms? I don't know, yeah. but to, to think in terms of a city as a building or a system as a building, etc. I th I think that's very much part of this um, discourse or thinking, that this is uh, how we try to grasp it, because this is really what we're struggling with. Uh, I think you were also <laughs> pointing this out. We, we really, sometimes it seems as if we've invented something, but we don't know quite what we invented, and then it's playing back on us. Mm -hmm. So this, in this sense of how technology is being humanized, we are of course being technologized and, and the data center or the architecture of the data center is one of the, yeah, what we think of as one of the more extreme examples. But, um, yeah, so, so I see a lot of continuities uh, yeah. at play, yeah. Well, you could also um, investigate it perhaps from, from, from a different perspective. When, when it is true that these data centers are a kind of uh, synthesis of our, of, our, of our memory, of everything we know, then there is an association with at least with a library. A library is something similar, it used to be. There's also a similarity with what we already know with the storehouse, so I need to start to wonder, there's nothing new, actually. Um, but that doesn't mean it's the same. Sorry? That, does, that it's not new doesn't no. mean it's the same. No, no, it's not the same, of course, of course not, of course not. No, no, that's true. <laughs> How would you approach the similarity of these kind of buildings? Um, faceless buildings which contain actually everything that we know, all our memories, uh, to architectural precedents? Uh, it's a very good question because uh, we, we mentioned it previously before, There's a, there is now a shift between what was just these big industrial buildings uh, that, that are kind of like faceless uh, in no man's land, nobody goes yeah. to see them, versus actually having them as part of the integrated environment. It's a very nice example you show of the, uh, the AM3 uh, and 4 uh, by um, um, Bentham Crowell Architects yeah. in Amsterdam, because it's actually, it is a beautiful, you can actually be having a very expressive piece of architecture yeah. 
uh, representing something that you now use as, uh, as, as a visual for where your data is stored. This is one fragment, tiny fragment of the 8 million data centers around the world, mm -hmm. which you, you do not see, which is, again, built in this kind of very traditional industrial style that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't really think of uh, being uh, anything interesting. The thing, the thing with data centers is it's based on very fundamental things. You have a place to store data, you have a place of you need to cool the, uh, the, uh, the, the data, and you need power. And once you have this kind of uh, these mix, if you can create a building which is uh, integrating all those components together in a very seamless, elegant, and quite uh, uh, attractive-looking uh, piece of architecture, that that can be a, a, a good uh, uh, a good success. And the the, the the relationship with data centers and clean rooms, uh, because you you presented uh, the the case study of ASML, ASML is this kind of. It's not really a, a no man's land, I, I, would, I would argue, because there is 16,000 people working on campus there. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as like in the, the data centers in Ames Harbor, there's like two and a half, three thousand 3,000 people working in those facilities. So they are uh, a restricted area, let's say, but they're not uh, uh, forbidden areas. And especially for ASML, the clean room factor, the actual high tech uh, facility, the parts where they actually build the machines for, for the chips, is one fragment of the total. Uh, uh, let's say the industrial uh, areas which um, people actually work in, and there's a huge amount of different uh, factors. And there's the R&D, uh, there's there's the um, people that are working in the cleaners themselves. There's marketing, there's PR, there's the sales. That that in itself for a clean room and for these high tech facilities is um, really important to take into consideration. So when you when you talk about uh, yeah the, the, the data centers. Um, I don't know, like when, when, when you want to talk about data sense as, a, as an architecture expression, it is a very, um, it's a very one, it's a one small part of like the overall uh, discussion of what a data center really is, uh, if I put it like that. Yeah. What do we hear? Yeah. <laughs> a car. Cars going past. Cars. <laughs> Somebody's looking for a parking spot. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> Somebody's looking, looking for, for a parking, parking spot. spot so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How would you look at this issue of buildings without people, only with machines? Yeah, we see it not only in these data centers, but also in what these data centers are used for, right? So, for instance, in the factory floors or in the warehouses, we see yeah. kind of extreme version of boxology where, where the, the box is the ideal thing for many things and also for computing and so the, 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 the chip design itself is, is, a, is a square with, with square kind of connections and I find it very aesthetically interesting that these buildings also reflect this very hard lines and this very kind of monolithic clean surfaces which is represented in the technology in itself, the, the chips and the, and, the, and, the, and the data part. Um, and on the other hand, it also links back to the first kind of dehumanizing technologies because it becomes really sterile and, and boring and non-tactile. And if I see it, all, look at all these kind of spaces, a, a data center is not a place you, you, it's not a very joyful space to be in, let's say. So you want to be in and out. And, and that is a... Um, but but on, on the contrary, or that's, what, that's what I'm saying, oh. is like the data center, the physical data center yeah. where the racks and the servers are, are yeah, exactly, like one yeah. entity of the entire of the whole, data center yeah, of course, facility. Yeah. So yeah. when you start to design a data center, you're, you're, you're designing, uh, you have to design the, the facility in which your data is stored, but you're also designing the place where humans work. Yeah. So yeah, that's where the fun part is. And I've yeah. been into many of these uh, data center offices from Amazon and Google, yeah. and they are really cool places to be. They are dynamic, they are built, uh, are designed, interior designed to create uh, a creative work, uh, workspace yeah. that you are 90% sitting behind your desk, isolated from the space where you're actually controlling, yeah. and then maybe 10% or even 5% of the time you're actually spending in yeah. the, 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 the white space itself. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah. Again, the point is that it's it's the data centers, the building, the, the, where the server is stored, this this library, as you were mentioning, is one part. But it's it's as as a as a design for these kind of facilities. Mm -hmm. What you see here yeah. uh, on the image yeah. uh, is like this is a beautiful example of uh, of basically in, enclosing data. It's like it's like a hard drive that you see. But what, uh, what is really nice in, uh, in that building also is the office environment, which you don't, uh, the AM3, mm. where a lot of it's really nice, very sustainable, very nice working environment. 
And that's where the human element is. Yeah. Yeah. But why, why are we upset that these spaces are not for humans? Most of the world or the universe is not for humans. Yes, <laughs> I'm, but That's having this, this experience of this afternoon makes me long for, uh, for a clear distinction between the world of things <laughs> and the world of, ma of humans. I don't see the, I, yeah. don't, I, don't, I still don't really see a problem here. Yeah. Um, final remarks before we get to the questions and answers of the audience, if there are questions. Carolina, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you have to stop, yeah. Uh, Justin, are there questions and answers or questions that we should answer or? Not so far. Not so far. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, um, if you don't feel the urge to add anything to the discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah there. I like this image. Yeah, there's so many things to discuss, Bernard. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's great. I don't know if the people on the other side of the screen get what we are experiencing here, that the space is taken over by skateboarders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so clearly, functionalism is not the real world, right? It's all <laughs> <laughs> maybe also with these spaces. But one of the things that is really interesting, what, what you and, and Husni put on the table, is that architecture, as a humanist discipline, you don't define humanism so much vis-a-vis uh, -vis nature, or the cosmos, or universal knowledge, it's you define the human vis-a-vis -vis technology, yeah. and the sublime of the technology. And this is something that we really have to come to terms with, or maybe not, mm. but, but I think this is part of the discussion at the moment. And well, that's a good final conclusion, Dirk. Thank you very much for that. Um, this has been for all of us one of the more uh, strange experience in our in experiences in our life, I suppose. Uh, we have to live with that. Um, I'm still confused, but at a higher level. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining me and also for the audience. Thank you for, for joining us this afternoon and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>